welcome to episode 405 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans Weekly Podcast of Many Topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and uh, listeners, maybe you heard us mention it last week, but we are celebrating the Year of the Dragon with around five or six very dragony episodes in early 2024. And uh, we're continuing that with two episodes on Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age, uh, one of my favorite games of the entire 2010s uh, on the P- or one of my favorite games on the PS4. I'm going to be really excited to talk about this game, but let's also hear from some other panelists, starting with Gio Castillo. Hello. Also, Tin Manuel. Hey. And Wes Island. Hey, everybody. Wes Tin Gio. Uh, I've already made my stance clear, probably on a bunch of episodes. I love this game. Um, I planned on playing this uh, like gradually in January and February, but I was having so much fun. I just blazed through it. Uh, it took me about 80 hours and I finished it li- like in the, in January 20th or something. I just, I, uh, I had so much fun replaying this. I, uh, I played it when it came out in 2018 in North America and sometime in the last two or three years, I bought this, the switch version, uh, 11 S which has some changes and some enhancements. And I played it on the switch this time around. But um, uh, let's hear a similar version from you. Uh, what uh, what got you into Dragon Quest or maybe just Eleven? Um, starting with you, Wes. I know that you're an OG for Dragon Quest that goes back probably further than I do. Yeah, I, I learned to read on the original Dragon Warrior, the copy that came with Nintendo Power. Uh, it was one of my mom's favorite games, and I would look over her shoulder and ask what all this meant. Um, and I, I've been hooked on the series ever since, so... Uh, once the series kind of started coming back into more prominence in America, I was over the moon. Um, right around Dragon Quest Eight, it seemed like they started taking this, the series seriously again and releasing more and more of them. Um, and yeah, I played Dragon Quest Eleven right when it came out, uh, beat it then, beat it on the Switch version when it came out, playing through the PS4 or Dragon Quest Eleven S on the PS4 now um, for no reason other than to get trophies at this point <laughs> yeah you know I, I i probably attach uh the 11s to the switch a little bit but it is on pc and was re-released on ps4 and is, and uh, probably other consoles that i'm not thinking of right now but yeah, uh, it on xbox at least oh oh it's on xbox as well mm-hmm. oh, oh all right excellent more dragon quest for everybody exactly um, uh, i don't go quite as far back as you do um, when I had an NES in the early 90s, I did rent uh, the Dragon Quest games multiple times. I, I think all of them at least once because I, I loved Final Fantasy 4 and wanted to play RPGs for my NES, which were, you know, Final Fantasy 1 and some Dragon Quest games. Or, uh, but I, I, they were, I also thought they were Dragon Warrior at the time. I don't think I finished any of them, but I thought they were really fun and interesting. But I, I mean, I liked FF4 and FF6 more. Then um, in, the, in the 2000s, I get into emulation in a big way. I get Game Boy Color copies of Dragon Warrior 1 through 3. I play through basically the entire series up through 9 in the 2000s. And that's really what made me a Dragon Quest super fan. I just played all of them. And uh, when 11 came out, I could not have been more excited. Everything about it looked beautiful, looked like exactly what I wanted. And it ended up being pretty much exactly what I wanted. I I, I was blown away at the time. But um, uh, Geo, I think we were, uh, you and I were on a Dragon Quest music episode of Rhythm Encounter um, a few months ago. That's right. And, and you mentioned that you were trying to play them mostly in order, but hadn't gotten to Dragon Quest Eleven yet. And I guess but that was, again, a few months ago, and now here we are. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I didn't make progress. Like, I stalled at 6 and decided... When, 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 when this episode, like, you know, became, like, official, I, I decided, oh, let's just jump to Eleven. I think it's fine. Like my new plan is to do like go back to six, seven, eight, nine, and then eleven S, and maybe if they ever put out ten, like here, like in the West, like then, then I'm gonna do that too. But yeah, I, I just couldn't wait anymore. I just I heard so many good things about eleven. Um, I started with uh, Heroes actually, like the Muso game. Dragon Quest Heroes. Yeah, oh, that's I'm, my stuff I'm, right there. I'm, yeah. I'm well aware of that, and I'm thinking about playing that. Uh, soon ish maybe i'm on a dragon quest high it is very good especially especially if you like elena because she's uh and she she gets a prominent role in that game and 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 her her uh her buddy uh kiro uh, they're they're hilarious 
<laughs> they're the highlights so of the game for me yeah and yeah they, they, they were my introduction i mean that game was my introduction to dragon quest and ever since then i've just been loving the series so at this point i'm i'm basically a super fan just like you guys <laughs> Excellent. Now, uh, uh, Tin, I think you mentioned um, before we started recording that this was your first time playing Dragon Quest XI, but uh, how far do you go back with Dragon Quest? Um, actually, my first um, exposure to Dragon Quest was not really me. It was my brother with DQ8. But then our disc was broken. <laughs> there were some, <laughs> some scenes with wouldn't load up so yeah we didn't really have the good experience with that and then when dq11 released my brother was also the one who bought it and i was just watching him while he was playing it and i was also like finding it really good so i was like okay maybe i'm not gonna watch him play anymore and i'll just play it sometime and fast forward to this year, yeah, it's my <laughs> finally my chance to play it. I think uh, the main reason was also when when I, when G also suggested that maybe I would wanna try it, and yeah, and I'm glad I I did because it's so good. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, before we continue, I and um, this is for the listeners as well as for me, just to organize my thoughts a little bit. Um, Dragon Quest XI is pretty cleanly divided into three different acts, uh, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. And we're going to really only discuss up to the end of Act 1 today. And uh, Part 2 is going to be focused on Act 2 and Act 3 and what, uh, and what they mean for everybody. Because Act 2 is, I, I would say Act 1 and 2 are excellent. Act three is a little controversial, and some people love it, and some people don't love it. So, but we're, all that discussion is going to be for next week. Today, we're just going to talk about what we like and don't like about b- the basics of Dragon Quest XI and all the story in Act One. And uh, I know that's not a problem for any of us here, because uh, I mean, Wes has played the game before, and uh, Geo and Tin, you're both at the end of Act Two, beginning of Act Three. Uh, you told me before we recorded, so. Uh, but just trying to set expectations for the listeners and so I can make some sense of my notes here. Um, at Dr- at Dragon Quest XI, um, how, where do I put this? It, first of all, this is, I, I think by far, the best-looking Dragon Quest game. Yeah. It is mm-hmm. stunning. The, like, mm-hmm. the, the, uh, I mean, Dragon Quest has had uh, Akira Toriyama of uh, Dragon Ball and Dr. Slump fame as its artist since the very, very beginning. And... So and all of these characters are unmistakably Toriyama characters with the spiky hair, the very thick bold lines, uh, sort of illustrating everybody. The um, the sort of I don't know the the heads that are different shaped, but the eyes that are always sort of the same shape. The 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 uh, the demons that always look a little bit like reptilian aliens. Um, like they're very unmistakably Toriyama designs, uh, but they just are so beautiful and well illustrated and animated that um the first uh my my first reaction to playing this game uh you know five and a half years ago was holy moly dragon quest has never looked better and uh and and, i mean everything from the the giant environments the character animations uh, everything besides the main character's hair i just love the look (laughs) yeah um, for some reason um i i'm i'm playing the s version and G is playing the the original one from mm-hmm. the PS4 version. For some reason, when I played it, after I played, and then whenever Gio would, would boot up the original, I would also be stunned at um, the visuals of the original. Like, it's just, it's beautiful. It's lush. <laughs> it's vivid. It's more vivid than the... Like, yeah, S even version. if the S version has a smoother frame rate, I don't know. The original just looks more vivid to me. I, yeah, I, I, I think that it has it has more uh, textures and better draw distance, mm-hmm. and then and, and maybe some better quality lighting and color in the original. I, I haven't done a side by side comparison, but I mean the S version does have to be able to run on a handheld switch, 
So that's uh, uh -huh. so that that that's and the uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and and, yeah. and the original eleven did not have such a limitation because it was only PS4. Mm -hmm. And but uh, well, the original eleven also did have a 3DS version that was only released in Japan. And in the uh, S remake, you can switch between the 3D PS4 look and the handheld 3DS look um, anytime you visit a church. Oh, right. But, uh, yeah, but but for the most part, I mean, I've been playing it 3D all the way. because 3D that's just, looks too good. It, yeah. it looks too good. And, and that's sort of what Dragon Quest XI is to me. Mm -hmm. So I, th 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 I mean, my decision was made. And, and uh, But also, I mean, if you play in the 3DS, uh, in the 2D visuals, you have to deal with... Uh, um, with in entirely random encounters and not encounters oh, visible oh in the field, so it's uh, so it's like <laughs> oh, I don't I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's it and, and it's nice that um for the most part enemies are easy to avoid if you really don't want to get into a fight. So mm -hmm. uh, you can go through dungeons without getting into a single random encounter mm -hmm. most of the time if you're playing in 3D, and which is mm -hmm. uh, which is also something that they did in the 3DS remakes of seven and eight. And I something I value very, very much about all of those versions of the game. Yes. I really think that Dragon Quest XI is like the platonic ideal of a AAA turn-based RPG. It, it does all of the basics that you would expect out of it, and it executes it about as perfectly as you can, uh, including the big visual splendor of being like a, you know, a AAA quality game. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Like, I think that's like the X factor of XI, like it kind of, uh, even if it's not like the most like um, original narrative or like story, like just general story, like the way it executes it is just beautiful. Like it's like it, you can tell it was made by masters of the genre. I don't know. That's how I felt playing it. And I mean, Dragon Quest has sort of always been like that. The storytelling and the writing is very simple and clean. Uh, do, do not reference another Square Enix RPG series. <laughs> d, d, just, just don't. We're throwing that out here. Um, but like, like uh, the comparison I make all the time is that Final Fantasy games are like uh, science fiction or fantasy epics that have uh, wild characters and situations, some convoluted writing, some in incredible drama, but they, they get messy and fantastical and weird. Um, but Dragon Quest games are more like fairy tales that you can oh, yeah. exp explain in a few sentences. Uh, uh, and uh, and the, the issues that you resolve as you travel around the world like sound like fairy tales or parables. Like in, just in, in Dragon Quest XI... Oh, uh, what what to do here? Um, you 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 discover a mermaid that fell in love with a fisherman. Uh, you go and look for the fisherman, but you can't find him because uh, the mermaid has been waiting for over fifty years and does and forgot that humans have short lifespans. But so but then uh, so then you can go and either tell the mermaid that uh, the her her long lost fisherman is dead, or tell him that he's that he's uh, still coming, and she'll uh, <laughs> and 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 uh, and let's see what's another one. Um, in Sniffleheim, uh, every the entire uh, uh, a, a witch cursed the town to make it entirely covered in ice. So you uh, try to um, free the town from its curse, but the uh, but the witch was actually in the town trying to trying to tick, trick you into into unleashing her full power. Like just like little situations here and there could be their own short stories. Um, the, the Dragon Quest games are often very segmented. It's like you need to go and visit each town and resolve the problem going in uh, happening in each town but then once the entire story comes together they all fit neatly together like a puzzle piece in in, in dragon quest 11 um every single town in the game has situations in act two i'm sorry in act one act two and act three that sort of build on each other and uh and leading to a finale that's that, that that's rewarding the more you uh explore the story and the more you uh um uh and and the more you revisit your uh the pre previous places you visited i oh man i could talk about dragon uh yuji hori's storytelling a lot but it, it's it, <laughs> but in general it's sort of segmented and sort of simply written but very beautiful and very wholesome and mm -hmm. everything neatly fits together at the end when you see it all come together and just neatly organized it's so it, it's so emotionally satisfying to get through one of these yeah actually i thought uh after uh completing act two 
um well even in during act one i was also it, this is like by far the best game i've played that um highlights every character in the game like every character in the party are they're they're everyone's a main character yeah there's a full arc for every character yeah and they don't feel like they're they're shoved in there they feel like a natural part of the game a natural mm-hmm. part of those vignettes at the different places you visit yeah and they and all of those stories come together <laughs> it, it, it's, just, it's just really good you know it's like it's orchestrated you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i don't think any character gets the short shrift here even like mm-hmm. um Oh, skipping ahead, uh, uh, maybe a little bit. Like, Eric is the first character that joins you, mm-hmm. and uh, and and Eric's great. He's uh, I've been playing in the Japanese dub, so I was uh, interested to discover his name's Kamui in J- in Japanese. Um, but Eric joins your party, but he's not in the forefront of the story for most of the rest of Act One. Mm-hmm. But then in Act Two, he uh, gets his own arc that recontextualizes everything that you know about him. Mm-hmm. And then you get to revisit that arc in Act Three, and just it all reminds you. It's like, oh yeah, Eric's awesome. He just joined at the beginning, so I forgot about him for a little while. <laughs> uh, and that, but he's also kind of hard to forget because he he's maybe the biggest physical damage dealer in your entire party if you uh, if you invest in some skills and set up with mm-hmm. him. I, I, I'm I agree. There's there's eight main characters here, and all of them get story moments, optional side quest moments character moments and uh, none of them feel forgotten by the end there's no uh oh what's what's an unfortunate uh uh previous example there's no nobody like nevon in dragon quest 6 who a lot of people just forget even exists by the uh if they've played a couple dragon quest games that's a good pull that's <laughs> accurate <laughs> the listeners will be like nevon who's Nev? oh right and uh, if they if they can actually remember him well if i brought up the beginning of the game and eric let's uh set the stage a little bit better um the uh, dragon quest 11 begins in the tiny town of cobblestone you're uh, the main character just turned oh i think either 16 or 17 so he has to do this test of courage in cobblestone you get to you do a very short dungeon you meet um your best friend Gemma and your dog sandy and it, everything's very very uh pastoral and cute in cobblestone but then they uh, reveal at the end that uh the symbol on your hand means that you're actually the chosen luminary the hero that's going to save the world so this and uh, and now it's time for you to go to the big kingdom, the big city of Heliodor, uh, not far away from Cobblestone and present yourself to the king. You do that. But then things take a dark turn. Um, th- this the, this beginning mirrors uh, Dragon Quest three a little bit, because at the beginning you meet the king, you go, you set, you get sent on a quest to find the six orbs and then save the world. But this time, instead of the king sending you on a quest, the king says, hey, if the if uh the if the luminary is is always appears at the same time as the monsters how do we not know that the monsters and the luminary are working together <laughs> and uh they, they throw you in the dungeon and uh you're you're branded as the dark spawn uh which is a, a remark remarkable timing with the dragon age episodes that we had two weeks uh two months ago uh and uh and you're slated to probably be executed but um, you meet a thief also incarcerated in the prison. That's er- that's our boy Eric. You um, Eric helps you escape, and then you're um on on the run from the uh, from the King of Heliodor's soldiers led by Hendrik and Jasper. Uh, Hendrik is sort of the 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 more the larger sort of more stoic, honorable warrior, while Jasper is the um is the sort of uh, human sized uh, t- tactician and cunning warrior. Uh, Suave. And- <laughs> Yeah, so I would say, I would say that uh, Jasper's more suave and ha- handsome, and Hendrik is more big and burly. But uh, no, no, no disrespect to either of them, but some disrespect to one of them later. Uh, and then, and the, so the hero and Eric are on the run. You, uh, uh, Eric, had a treasure hidden in this a, in a, uh, in a in a dungeon outside of Heliodor. So you grab that, you use this portal to, to go to the opposite side of the con- to the opposite. Uh, you know, it's the same continent to the opposite side of the same continent to um, get away from the Heliodoran soldiers. Uh, You meet uh, twin sisters, Veronica and Serena, when you're going through uh, uh, the town of Hoto. Mm -hmm. Um, They're twins, but um, Veronica is around half Serena's size because she got cursed by a monster 
that um that uh, took away her magic power and and um and her uh and her years her actual age and so she gets her magic power back but she is um i think she's physically maybe 10 years old while uh serena is still physically say 18 years old so they're like two twin sisters but one of them has been shrunk down to child size uh and then uh not long after that in the town of galapagos galapagos you meet uh the delightful silvando who is a sort of roguish character who's a circus performer and a swordsman uh kind of a jack of all trades but he only cares about bringing smiles to the world and when he realizes that you're the luminary on a quest he uh offers his services and his boat that lets you travel uh, uh all around Eventually, you get to the town of Octagonia because you're looking for an item that they're awarding as a prize in their fighting tournament, and which will allow you to um, to get get your way to the tree egg dracel where the um, the luminary is supposed to go. And uh, in getting that, you meet your the last two party members of Act One: Jade, the beautiful martial artist, and Rab, the uh, the wise and slightly perverted sage. So, uh, <laughs> so Hero, Eric, Veronica, Serena, so, uh, Silvando, Jade, and Rab are your team for the first half or so of the game and i'm just getting this out there i love them the it's the a killer uh, team it is everyone has great lines everyone uh, is is capable of humor and drama and we t- we talked about how none of the characters feel neglected by games end um everyone has multiple builds depending on how you set up their equipment and skills uh it's it's just so fun interacting and and tinkering with these with, with these seven um so I, if you've heard me on podcasts before, I think I've drafted Silvando and Jade in different uh, 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 RPG character drafts in the past. So I, I think safely those are my two favorites. But uh, um, does anyone want to talk about their favorite character, even if it's the main, even if it's the luminary um, in Act One? Well, I, I love Eric the most, I think. Um, and that's I don't know why, but I. Oh, okay. Well, when when I, I just want to say, like, uh, in my head, canon, uh, he's in a committed relationship with the luminary. Like, they nice. Each other. <laughs> 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 and I don't know. Like, it just colors my perception. Like, I just think, oh, that's my boyfriend when I when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I just I adore him. He's like he's like a really wonderful iteration of like the thief character. Mm-hmm. Um, he not to go into act two stuff but like his backstory is like really kind of it's quite touching actually and um um and the i don't know he's just with you from the start and it's like hard i feel attached to him like i love serena i love veronica i love everyone else but um he's he's been there with you from since day one so much love to eric <laughs> uh, oh go ahead with oh. <laughs> Okay. Uh, for me, it's got to be Silvando. Uh, Silvando, he speaks to the non-binary part of me in a big way because he doesn't get too bothered by gender norms or by any norms, really. Um, but he still manages to be this really strong, focused character. He might have the, the best clarity of purpose of anyone in your party in, in a few ways. Um he can be absolutely hilarious, but he can actually do the serious part well too, which is rare for this kind of character. You, you see that, you get worried this is going to be some kind of gay panic stereotype, and it's not. The The game never makes fun of him for who he is. The game always appreciates Silvando as like the wonderful human that he can be. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, Silvando is always presented as flamboyant and mm. maybe, maybe a little bit silly. But uh, they make it very clear. Silvando's strong. He like uh, he is a like a master knife thrower and swordsman, and just and is is never ever shown to be weak or cowardly. And all and uh, and is sort of like equal parts warrior and entertainer. And everyone that meets Silvando is is uh, totally delighted by him. Like he, w- like he'll whether he's just starting a, an impromptu dance party at a feast <laughs> in the castle. Or he's, uh, you know, uh, this is sk- skipping ahead a little bit, like just finding a, a parade of followers to join him uh, <laughs> at wa- walking, walking around the continent. Um, Silvando <laughs> is a flamboyant stereotype in a way, but never, ever portrayed negatively and is, I think, one of the most, probably the most beloved of the companion characters in this game. 
Um, and uh, what was the last one bit? Uh, uh, I, I, the, I think that the name Salty Stallion is pretty hilarious as a ship. <laughs> Well, me playing the game, like at first, I also, when I also first encountered um, Eric, it's, I was also very attached to him. But oh my god, almost every time, every single time I meet a new companion, I'd be like, oh, I love this. I love this better. (laughs) (laughs) I can't pick. (laughs) But yeah, I guess summarizing it all. If I really had to pick, I'd also probably pick Silvando as well. All for all the reasons that you guys just mentioned. <laughs> and and you know, maybe just so someone besides Silvando gets some attention. Uh, I love Jade. Yeah. <laughs> like a, Jade's, uh, Jade's number two for me. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful martial arts girl is kind of a, uh, you know, it's an RPG stereotype. All of us have probably partied up with five or six minimum beautiful martial arts girls. Mm-hmm. But she is a super cool one of those. Uh, her moves are very stylish. Uh, she gets a lot of cool uh, scenes in the game where she's just just kicking fools left and right. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. and um, more than anyone else, honestly. Yeah, I, I think she gets like the coolest action scenes. Uh, she does. A- a- outside mm-hmm. of actual ba- uh, battle, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, she like those legs were made for kicking. <laughs> mm-hmm. It feels like the cutscenes make her like in terms of power level. She seems like the most powerful party member because she beats she even like goes toe-to-toe with hendrix she kicks eric's ass like a, I don't yeah, know, she really is the physical powerhouse of the team mm-hmm. yeah yeah she has the lowest mp in the team by far i'm not even sure she broke like 120 when i got to like level 99 <laughs> <laughs> but she's uh but she's very very good at kicking and attacking and um uh she's sort of a physical whether you give her and and um also uh one thing that Dragon Quest has done a little bit in the past, there's a stat called Charm, which is basically how attractive uh, and uh, you are. And uh, in 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 even in the older games, if your charm stat was very high, you could distract enemies and they would be enthralled by you. And that's true for everyone in this game, even if the like the hero or uh, or like Serena or Eric has a very high charm stat, they'll be like, oh, the the heel slime was entranced by uh, by Eric's charm. Um, Jade and Silvando have massive charm stats mm-hmm. uh, with, with equipment that can get the, get them even higher and a few uh, spells and attacks that scale off of charm instead of attack or magic. So you can um, it's actually not a bad idea to build Silvando with as much charm boosting equipment as possible and just having him use um, like uh, oh, like his his fabulous finger move or his uh, or his blow kiss move or his hustle dance move to be like a really good like like handsome spellcaster <laughs> hustle dance is the uh, the ability of the game for as far as i'm concerned <laughs> yeah it, it is by far the best healing spell until like uh a, i think a couple characters learn multi-heal maybe in yeah. the mid-20s mm-hmm. but like you can get, learn hustle dance way before anyone gets multi-heal and it scales with charm so it'll eventually heal more than multi-heal does unless unless you know serena's magic mending can get absurdly high but uh and and then Serene is basically only good for healing, but Silvando mm-hmm. can kind of do it all, including including group heals. It's oh man, I I could talk about skill builds and tinkering with all with all of them. Does um th- does did anyone have a, a either a weapon choice or a favorite ability that they used uh, in the, let's say the first half of the game? Let's not go too far into the end game. Uh, oh, for um, I can say that for Eric, I I beeline dual wielding, but I made him a boomerang guy, so like I gave him like full aoe powers like <laughs> yeah it was a lot of fun yeah yeah eric with boomerangs is like the best group attacker and eric with daggers is like the best single target attacker <laughs> but, you, but you don't get the best dagger moves like uh like divide until act two i think so uh mm-hmm. but 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 eric so eric needs a little bit of help and he doesn't have heavy armor or anything but dual wielding eric is incredible damage he's so much fun yeah. Divide, Absolutely. poison, purse cutter, just watch things uh-huh. melt. <laughs> he's he's like a permanent um party member on my in in all almost every single act that I've played. So it, it, the only time he would be missing is when, you know, <laughs> during act act two. Yeah. Right, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My uh my old reliable is Jade with a spear throwing multi thrusts out. Oh, mm. 
Also yes. that as well. <laughs> you oomph her and you just let her go and things do not enjoy what she can do to them. Yeah. Uh, I also gave the Luminary a dual wield. Like I beelined that and then Falcon Sword on both both ends fully maxed with the Forge. It's powerful stuff. It feels like, so can, good. Yeah, it feels so good. You can do that really early on. It's It's awesome. Uh, uh, remarkably, I built my characters almost the same way this time that I did five years ago, just because I, I sort of knew which what I liked about them and what I wanted to do with them. So I did a lot of the same stuff. I had spears, jade, and uh, um, dual and Eric switching between boomerangs and knives, and uh, Veronica with stabs and so on. But the one thing I did differently was I actually had the hero with great swords this time around, and wow. um, Hella Chopper and Unbridled Blade. Yeah. are really yeah. really good he's uh great sword hero is excellent and um but but i don't think he gets uh an awesome boss attacking well actually unbridled blades really is about as good as a like falcon slash uh hero but when you eventually learn sword dance which can be done with a uh, dual wield or sword and shield or great sword i think the damage is actually much better with great swords. I, uh, I, I had fun. Like the, the hero wields great swords a little uh, slowly. Like they're almost too heavy for him, but he, <laughs> but he really kicks ass with them. Um, and, and, uh, and I should say that the one character that I think never left my party, uh, was remarkably not Jade or Silvando or Eric. Uh, it was Veronica. I, because Veronica can cast oomph on your attacking characters and sap on enemies to lower their defense and has powerful, uh, spells of her own. I just had staff Veronica in my party all the time. Uh, and uh, she never left until act two uh, sort of shakes up your party makeup a little bit. And um, yeah, she's pro like in, in battle. My favorite characters are probably like, I don't know, maybe Veronica, Jade, Eric. But then for the actual bosses, I'll switch out uh, Jade for Silvando because his support, support moves are so good. And maybe the hero for a, a different character that we'll talk about later because uh, his defense is so good. It's so good. Yeah, the, the, the different parties, uh, the character stuff you can do in the party setups are super fun in this game. No, I was going to say, I got I to gotta give a moment to the Swiss Army Rob, who's like the red mage of the game and can do a little bit of everything too. Yes. Um, he's, he's one of those characters who like, he's not going to do the best at anything, so you're often going to find other people. But my favorite party setup is specifically there to do Electrolyte, which is an ability that can turn a group of enemies into metal slimes of various Ooh. sorts. Oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I always keep uh, the hero, Jade, and Silvando in my party, because once those three are pepped up, that's how they, uh, they activate that ability. And then I keep Rob to just support them in any way that he needs to. <laughs> Rob has an ability called Dirge of Dundrasil that can put metal slimes to sleep. So combining... Mm -hmm. Electrolyte with Dirge of Dundrasil is maybe the best way to level up uh, uh, at the at the super end game. Um, it, I mean, if you do that setup correctly once, uh, you can gain like six, seven levels in one fight. It's great. It's really impressive. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about the story. I mean, we talked about uh, basically Hato Galopolis. Um, there's, I want to say, around 10 uh, cities, villages that you pass through in Act 1. And each one of them has you know, their own struggles, their own situations, their own vibes. They're, they're almost all based on a real world country or locate or, or region, which is, you know, Dragon Quest has been doing this forever. I mean, I mean, it's, you're practically going through like a, a, an entire United Nations worth of accents in Dragon Quest seven. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, and you sort of resolve the issues in each one. And that points you in the direction of the next town or the next, uh, uh, crisis to resolve. Um, do, uh, does anyone have like we? I don't want to go through every town and every uh, location like bit by bit, but does anyone have a favorite city or a favorite story situation that you uh, that you encountered in the in Act One? Uh, for me, Gondolia is easily the funniest city because they're all like Scusi, my name is Placido. <laughs> <laughs> I lose my voice. And then that's where you meet Silvano. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah Gond well, Gondolia is definitely Venice because of the Italian accents and also the canals all, all the way through the city. <laughs> my, my favorite thing about Gondolia is there's two brothers that are both run an armor shop. Oh, and it, okay. if you go between them and say, well, the first brother said he would sell it for 20000 oh, yeah. And if you go between them, you uh, once, in, once in each act, they will sell you a piece of armor that is w uh, very, very good 
for way cheaper than it's worth if you if you uh, if you turn them against each other and drive the price <laughs> down <laughs> which is well, just delightful <laughs> i was also so surprised where that's where you also find uh where you first see um Silvando's ship i was like well, what the hell he's f- rich <laughs> <laughs> i i was really just expecting a small boat or something when he told us to go there so <laughs> Nope, it's a it's a pink salty stallion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just an amazing boat and name and everything about it. <laughs> well, for me, um I enjoyed Sniffelheim as well, like the story mm. there about the city getting frozen and there's that witch where you have to who was trying to fool us. Uh, yeah, compared to all the other towns, I think that's the one I really enjoyed the most. I I, I love the witch Crystalinda because yes, <laughs> like like when, when when you fight her, she just seems like a normal like you know uh, one off villain that you never hear from again after you defeat her. Yeah. But uh, but if you keep <laughs> hanging around Sniffleheim after you defeat her, the queen Queen Frizabelle's like. Actually, you know, I'm I'm really inexperienced at this because my dad died less than a year ago. Do you think you could stay on as my advisor? Yeah. <laughs> and you can and you can find Crystalinda and Frizabel at the cafe talking about Frizabel's boy issues. Um, you find a you find a man in town who's in love with Crystalinda, but then he realizes that she she gently rejected him, that saying that he was that he, it was a hundred years too early to be to be her lover. <laughs> like they, they they turned like um. Basically, Crystalinda like starts out as a one-off villain, but now but then is like a, just a very entertaining uh, NPC that sticks around. And in <laughs> in Act Three, Crystalinda's Crystalinda's awesome because there are three rare crafting materials that she will trade you. Uh, oh. um, uh, well, I'm trying to remember all of them. It's, it's I think it's black tears, kaleidocloths, and crimson and crimsonites, which are uh, just very very rare equipment uh, materials that you need for a bunch of equipment. And she'll trade them for serpent souls, and serpent souls are really easy to farm. While those other three uh, pieces of equipment, um, uh, those other three items are very difficult to find. Incidentally, Crystalinda became one of the most popular monsters in Dragon Quest Monsters of the Dark Prince, just because her her personality, everything about her, like it stuck out with Dragon Quest fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I oh man, I, I think I uh, at the risk of sounding very crude, I I think I tweeted a list of a few weeks ago of the best surprisingly hot moms in Dragon Quest XI, <laughs> and and, and, and Crystalinda was like uh, she was I think maybe second or third on the list. Yeah, it's like oh no, another hot mom. Where, where, where what's this coming to? It's like even even the even the mermaid queen and there's the and and now the uh, and and now the the uh, the elder of Hoto. What's going on? It's like I, it's like. Oh, when okay. Hendrik was like, "Oh, I don't want to be your like your boyfriend forever," I was like, "It's not really that bad." Like, you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there, I think there are worse punishments. Yeah. <laughs> for for towns, I've got to give a shout out to Hato too. It gets a lot of attention from the localization standpoint that honestly it deserves. I think there's a reason it gets a lot yeah, of Holy attention. moly. Mm-hmm. Everyone speaks in haiku. Every single except, person. <laughs> except for the, except for the small children who are still struggling to learn haiku and make, and are, and start making mistakes off to, um, over uh, occasionally. It's, it's <laughs> very, very sweet. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's one of those reasons why I love dragon quest translations and localizations because they're not always, direct but they're meant to evoke the same feeling that the original would evoke and this gives it such a unique sense of place um that even though sometimes some of these towns could run together with you know sometimes they have similar assets or similar town themes or whatnot they all feel incredibly unique thanks to this amazing localization oh my every one of these towns has like four bunny girls and one shirtless man with a bull mask on <laughs> but 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 thanks to but thanks to the town's atmosphere and everyone's accent you can figure out where everybody's from yeah that's maybe my favorite thing is when you go to oh, one the, town the bunny you girls are your favorite from... thing oh i, no, I see i see, no, how, no, no, I see no. how it is west oh my god i'm gonna get in trouble for this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fact that like you can find people in towns that are definitely from other towns and you can tell because they they carry over like the speech patterns of the place where they came from and that's just like next level work to me 
uh, Dragon Quest games have always had wordplay in them. The um, spells in every Dragon Quest game are uh, are named after Japanese onomatopoeia. So the the uh, in in English there's like frizzle, sizzle, crack, cra- uh, uh, boom, kaboom. In in Japanese, I know the frizz line of spells is based on meta, which is the sound of a fire crackling in Japanese uh, um, onomatopoeia. And um, and but because of that um. Every town uh, in in Japanese in the Japanese uh, tr- language track as well, every town will have some kind of uh, vocal tick or a, or some kind of pun that's free- frequently used, and they it, th- those don't translate super easily into English. So instead, they did the thing with different um, with uh, with different accents. It, I, I think it's excellent. They, like it, it's a lot of localization work trying to figure out how you know, especially just uh, just transliterating things like irish and scottish accents but it, it, it's um it, it does lend character and flavor to every different location um and i think dragon quest 11 does it maybe as well as any a game in the series it's uh it's it's, it's spectacular i wish they would do like a, a philippine location in dragon quest 12 <laughs> and like everyone would be speaking in taglish I'm, I'm, that's very common. Oh man, I'm trying to think. There, there are several, uh, like Pacific Islander towns, but that's not really the same as as the Philippines. Uh, Phenomenon in this game is definitely based on Southeast Asia, either mm-hmm. uh, probably mm-hmm. uh, either Cambodia, Laos, or Thailand, I think. And um, the, the, I really actually love the uh, uh, side quest that goes on in Phenomenon in the in Act yes. One, um, because it, you like uh, 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 there's an evil painting or a demon possessing a painting that's entrancing villagers, but it's also where you find the magic key, which leads which leads you to the uh, to the Sniffleheim uh, part of Act One, and also gives you uh, lets you open all the red doors because finding the thief key, magic key, and ultimate key, or sometimes just one or two of those is a tradition in i think every dragon quest game back to three is that right is that yeah. is that is that the one that started giving you fancy keys yeah i think so right but the... i played, replayed it recently and i think oh. that was the first one i remember excellent yeah that, that, that's that felt right to me but i but i'm um, not every game has all three keys there's there's only two in dragon quest 11 but uh i i, I thought that that was uh, also fairly unique because i mean i, I don't i don't know of very many rpgs that will have that will lend a s- distinctly southeast asian flavor to uh to a location i mean there's the literal encore wat based on cambodia in illusion of gaia but i don't know of many others I- i'm not sure other than some island towns i can't think of a of a philippine uh a, a, like analog a tagalog analog <laughs> <laughs> in a in a in a dragon quest game but there's hope for uh 12 flames of fate there's hope. Yeah, here's hoping. If oh, um, I can't wait. What, if if what? like a dragon can come to America, then Dragon Quest can come <laughs> to the Philippines. <laughs> I like a dragon, in infinite wealth kind of references the Philippines at some point. I think right? it's true. No, they they do mm-hmm. mention a character escaping to the Philippines at one point, mm. and there is there's actually a very prominent Filipina character in in Yakuza Four. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. She's they a uh, she's a she's a yeah exactly. She's an Interpol agent that is uh, tracking down a criminal in Tokyo. She's she's very mm-hmm. cool. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, th- th- otherwise, we, we could use some more um, uh, Filipino representation in RPGs. I, I support it. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I hope that listeners were conveying how much we are enjoying this this world and these characters. But one thing I think we mentioned a couple times that's legit one of my favorite minor things to do in this game. I got way... I, I mean, both times that I've played Dragon Quest XI, I got way too deep into weapon crafting. <laughs> the, the uh, you, you're always finding materials. You're always finding um, we- weapon and armor recipes, and you f- um, forge them in an item called the f- the fun sized forge, which in the PS4 version you have to use at camps, but in the uh, S version you can do- use any time from the menu. Um, and th- there's a sort of like a forging targeting mini game that you can level up your forge and learn forging special moves that'll let you uh, um, get perfect critical hit forge uh, like uh, like hammer strokes. <laughs> I I had a lot of fun getting basically every weapon and armor that I wanted to use um, maxed out to plus three because I I just love forging and crafting in this game. Yeah, there's a very addictive quality to it, and it's not like overly complicated because that sounds like it could become really really complicated but in the moment to moment of actually doing that forging it feels intuitive which is rare uh i often find that crafting mini games or crafting um 
portions of games can often be like the hardest to penetrate and it's just not the case oh god you're just looking up tables of uh of different crafting jobs in final fantasy 14 i think like <laughs> i think gave me stress i think gave me stress nightmares but um but in, in this game it's like it's it's very clean it's like oh here's the here's the pattern for this weapon here's where you're trying to get the hammer the uh where you're trying to get the meters to you can use this uh like, like this is a uh, this is how much each skill costs it's, it's basically like a like a little it, it's a little puzzle that mm-hmm. you get more moves and more stamina for the puzzles as you level up so like uh crafting is a tie is tied to level up leveling up in a sensible way it gives you tangible rewards because getting um, weapons earlier than you should or weapons boosted by a few percentage points is pretty significant I, I love crafting in this game, but uh, again, I knew off the top of my head the three crafting materials that Crystalinda trades for you in Act Three, so maybe I'm just yeah. I, I exact I have the exact brain for uh, for Dragon Quest Eleven forging. Uh, you know what? Because of the crafting system, every time I would go around each town and I would check every freaking shelf I could find (laughs) and just try to hope that that single red book would give me (laughs) a recipe. (laughs) Yeah, That that actually speaks to one of, there are a lot of quality of life things in Dragon Quest XI, like those red books that show you that this is a bookshelf you can interact with and get something out of. Mm -hmm. Oh, Um, back in the day, there would be books everywhere and only some of them would give you the the thing that you wanted. <laughs> then there was there was no visual indicator. I don't know. It is pure joy. Dragon Quest XI bottom <laughs> bottom line is pure joy. And uh, you know we mentioned uh, that the, that it has a similar setup at the very beginning of the game to Dragon Quest Three, but then subverts that setup by the king rejecting you rather than sending you on a quest. Um, Dragon Quest XI is full of references to Dragon Quest Three. The uh, eight playable characters are each a reference to one of the classes in Dragon Quest Three, with the exception of the merchant class. But uh, but you have a merchant buddy named Dirk that you meet at the uh, near the beginning of the game, so he's the, sort of the game's merchant. And in Act Three, you can um, merchant uh, you, if you finish Dirk's side quest, he'll set up the best shop in the game. Um, but but also in, in uh, the in order to uh, to this is a reference to Dragon Quest One and Dragon Quest Three. Um, in Dragon Quest XI, Act One, you're trying to uh, assemble the six orbs that'll create a bridge leading to Yggdrasil, the uh, the world tree. Um, Yggdrasil uh, is very prominent in Dragon Quest Three. Um, finding the six orbs is the thrust of, I would say, like the first, the entire plot of the first two thirds of Dragon Quest Three. Yeah. Um, and uh, but uh, you you don't find the, these six orbs under the same circumstances. But basically, they are rewards for six of the uh six of the sort of vignette short stories in in uh in uh dragon quest 11 like like um uh, doing finishing the sniffleheim crystalinda stuff gives you the blue orb um defeating the the painting and fi- and finding the magic key in phenomenon leads you to a dungeon that has the uh purple orb in it uh i i think a uh what's another one oh yeah um uh, going to octagonia and after you recruit rab and jade um, the the other prize, in addition to the rainbow, is the yellow orb. But uh, mm-hmm. like you, you find the six orbs, and then you build the, a rainbow bridge to Yggdrasil. And uh, finding items to build a ra- rainbow bridge to the final dungeon is most of the plot of Dragon Quest One, <laughs> way back in 1986. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, and from the classes to the characters to the some story setups, and then into some end game stuff that we'll talk about next week. Uh, Dragon Quest Eleven is very, very much a nostalgia play into Dragon Quest III, because Dragon Quest III was sort of the mo- iconic, most popular Dragon Quest game for many, many years, until I think that maybe uh, maybe 8 became more popular than 3 around when it was brand new. Uh, but uh, because th- Dragon Quest III set up a lot of what Dragon Quest became, like 11 having nostalgia plays to 3... And having a there's a lot of just memor like rem- remembering and reminiscing as part of uh in the story of Dragon Quest Eleven like there's a scene where the the hero briefly goes back in time and speaks to his deceased grandfather and and uh, and his grandfather Chalky who I think is a wonderful NPC the, the conversation mm-hmm. with him almost made me cry like mm-hmm. him reminiscing mm-hmm. about his adventuring uh is is like is a nostalgia uh play there's a uh, the name of the of the game uh, uh, echoes of an elusive age which in Japanese was uh, translated from 
In Search of Lost Time, which is also the original name of Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. I, I really do think that like Yuji Hori was feeling nostalgic for when he was younger and making older games. Maybe he maybe he's a he's a, a grandfather or a great uncle or something and, and thinking about youth because there's there's so there's so much grandpa energy in dragon quest 11 <laughs> about yeah. about about yeah. looking back and remembering the joys and tragedies of the past because i mean the scene where rab takes you to the ruins of dundrasil oh, re- reveals that he's the hero's grandfather and that when when the kingdom was destroyed by the uh by the demon lord 16 years ago uh he's been searching for you um ever since he also rescued jade the princess of heliodore when she was uh only a, when she was a, a a very young girl um everything about that was just so sad but also but also was about looking back in a way that i i think that 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 when hori was writing this game he like he was thinking about the past a lot and made this a game about remembering and about nostalgia but it the effect of it's very powerful it reminds me of everything i love about dragon quest while also being a beautiful story in the moment because i I mean tears came to my eyes when rab was just talking about how much he missed his daughter and how many regrets he has about what happened It's, it's it's heartbreaking same i've seen that scene three times now still tears every time (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well this game is just very very wholesome very um there's a lot of tearjerker moments that we'll get to in our next recording so yeah it, it, it's wholesome and colorful and cartoony looking but the actual events of the game are quite dark and tragic at some times mm-hmm. this is a game I, I don't i don't want to say that there's a clash or it's at odds with itself but this game um is beautiful and colorful, but the actual events taking place are serious and high stakes. Mm-hmm. So I don't. I mean, the edge lords that reject Dragon Quest for how it looks simply have not played or even read about Dragon Quest enough. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I, I mean, this, this game hits it on every note for me. I, I think the the only major disappointment about Dragon Quest XI is the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, Ko- Koichi Sugiyama's music is not bad. Like the individual tracks aren't horrible. <laughs> But there aren't very many of them in that like the regular battle music is just reused <laughs> in dramatic fight cutscenes. Yeah. That made me laugh the first time I was playing it, especially because you didn't have the orchestrated version in the original PS4 release. So yeah. it, it hit even <laughs> even less back then. Yeah, there are the scene of like um, of Hendrik chasing uh, the hero and Eric <laughs> before they can jump through the, po- the portal. And it's, it's like this intense uh, uh, chase on horseback back where they're shooting down your horses with arrows. And it's like, but it's still the ba, 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 <laughs> bow, <laughs> like from from every random battle. And or when uh, when um, Jade has one of her really dope martial arts scenes with it, where she's like, you know, kicking uh, Hendrik in the uh, in, in, at, in his shield, and it's it's just it's really really intense. It's still ba, 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 <laughs> bow, and it's it's like it's like really you, you couldn't. I mean, I'm not saying we all have to, like. I'm not saying that you can be Masayoshi Soken here, with uh, and and make bespoke music for every single moment, but really, that it, sometimes it feels like there are eleven songs on this entire soundtrack, and six and six of them are remixes from old Dragon Quest games. Yeah. Like, 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 look the uh, the the Academy of uh, of Metra Medai or whatever that that's the castle music from Dragon Quest Five. You can't yep. you can't hide that from me. That's the Dragon Quest game I've played the most times. But uh, yeah, it, I, I won't say every individual song is bad. Uh, it, it, it's just sort of mid at best and way yeah. repetitive and not enough and, and not diverse enough at worst. Because I, I mean, I, oh, my God, I I don't even remember where I was in the game. But uh, I, I was playing handheld while my girlfriend was playing Ace Attorney Collection on the on the TV and we're in the same room. And, uh, and, and she just, she just starts singing along to the music going, bah, 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 because she has heard, because even just living with me, she has heard this, the random battle music of Dragon Quest 11 far too many times. Uh, unpopular <sighs> opinion. That's why I was just laughing so much earlier. Uh, I do have, I barely have any like 
exposure when it comes to Dragon Quest games, but I played um, DQ Builders as well. And I was also Love getting annoyed at the music. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But but when I played Eleven, uh, unpopular opinion, I loved the battle <laughs> music so much. <laughs> <laughs> to the point that I would be the same as your girlfriend, I would always hum that that battle theme <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> Yeah, again, I, I don't think the battle theme is bad or the uh, the, the traversal or any of the town music. Is, I don't think it's bad. I just don't mm-hmm. think I just think we hear the same <laughs> yeah, I know. fewer than 10 <laughs> tracks over and over. And and none of these are like like mega bops. Like, I mean, oh, my God, I played uh, Octopath Traveler 2 last year and there's, I don't know, maybe five or six battle tracks in that game. And all of them are absolutely killer. But yeah, uh, yeah my my favorite Dragon Quest XI song is probably one of the DQ3 <laughs> remixes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, Koichi Sugiyama just kind of gave up. In like, I think they got about as much as they could get from him at that point. Yeah, so. I think he was probably over 90 years old and 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 uh, and ailing when Dragon Quest XI was made. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that he did contribute to Dragon Quest Twelve, but but maybe didn't oh, finish. No. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure. I'd have to I have to do some more research to be certain about that. But also, yeah. we haven't heard any news about Dragon Quest Twelve mm-hmm. in something like in almost three years. So I mean, I, I hope that game's still doing all right. Hmm. I'm sure it's fine. I, oh, I'm I'm not I'm not worried because it's still going to be Yuji Horii's writing and Akira Toriyama's character designs and mm-hmm. the, and Square Enix putting a lot of money and a lot of uh, and a lot of labor into it because uh i mean dragon quest 11 was so, it was so great and so well liked that i'm sure they're going to be uh they're going to be pulling out all the stops for dragon quest 12 i'm, I'm certain about that um uh, maybe the main character won't be quite as as handsome as clive from ff16 but <laughs> but but hopefully he'll have better hair than the luminary in dragon quest 11 <laughs> Luminary has the best hair. I, I don't know. Hair. I mean, it's smooth and silky, but it's like <laughs> he looks kind of like a like I I I don't know like 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 a um like a, commercial. like a Crusades era waif. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the hero has the worst, maybe the worst hair in the party, <laughs> and that that seems wrong for a Dragon Quest game. Because at, at least even at least Rob has a spruce mustache, <laughs> <laughs> pentiment ass hair. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I, I, that 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 was the like medieval European bad hair reference I needed. I needed to find perfect. This Joan of Arc ass quaff. There were like a few NPCs. I'm not sure in the game. I'm not sure. Was it NPCs or like a few a few characters? during the side quest who would actually compliment luminaries there yeah probably <laughs> yeah funny. maybe maybe some of the maybe some of the bald ones i don't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when you go to the uh to angry la the uh the tibet like town in um in act two i think I, I think maybe some of the monks there are jealous <laughs> yeah. of the of the luminaries hair yeah. that, that's only a vaguer memory um it's so silky but but this yeah exactly i mean, I mean <laughs> This game is really does have an innocent spirit, but but some dark story moments and events that I I think hit every hit every emotion from comedy to tragedy to you know to high drama to you know the low stakes of of uh, of teaching a boy how to be better at hide and seek, <laughs> which which is a side quest in Act Three that gives you I think ten mini medals, so it's, it's worth doing. Um, but you know one last memory I have of Act One is uh it goes back to how this game is about nostalgia and a spirit of adventure because um you'll uh you you find on bookshelves if you look at all of those red books trying to find recipes just like tin was um you'll you'll um find chronicles of an adventurer that did went to a lot of the same places that you go in this game um and they'll even mentions finding the rainbow and the orbs but and and then usually giving them back to the kingdom that found them. Or uh, I, I think they mentioned dropping the green orb into the sea. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and there's basically books where some nameless adventurer uh, went to a lot of the same places you do. And in Arborea, the last town in Act 1, which is right at the foot of the tree, it's where it's where uh, Ser- Serena and Veronica are from, 
um, in one of the houses, you find the final volume of that adventure, adventurer's book, and it's the hero's grandfather, Chalky. So, like, tying er everything you're doing to that to your grandpa from the beginning of the game but but so like this is a game about remembering and nostalgia that feels like old dragon quest games but looks more beautiful than any of them that hits a lot of really fun notes inside content and uh and and skill tinkering that really makes this an rpg with systems that could have been made in an rpg 20 years ago like like if a if a ps2 game had uh, a story like this or uh crafting like this we wouldn't be shocked but just every single part of it is a is an a plus that looks so gorgeous and plays so easily that it, it i mean I'm, i've said it, i said it, i say this over and over i think this is my favorite rpg of the 2010s and just there's so much we can learn from and so much to enjoy about dragon quest 11 that I had an absolute blast playing it uh, through basically for the first three weeks of January in uh, in 2024. But we still have a lot more to talk about because we've only we've only knocked on the door of Act Two a little bit uh, today. Um, next week we're going to talk all about Act Two and Three and its implications, and uh, maybe talk about some of our favorite fights and more favorite characters. There's uh, we have plenty to discuss here, but we've mostly um, touched upon what we can so far in Dragon Quest Eleven. Uh, uh and but you know this is really only the very beginning of uh of the year of the dragon here at retro encounter uh i think that um next week we're going to continue the discussion the following week we're probably going to be able to get into dragon age again a little bit I, and wes i know that you're uh this is that this is not the only game with dragon in the title that you've been playing correct and uh, Tin, I know this is this is also not the only game with Dragon in the title that you're playing because uh, also after that Dragon Age episode, we're gonna have a Dragon a, a like a Dragon Infinite Wealth spoiler cast. Um, it's the game that it, that uh, I was that I'm gonna get back to playing five minutes after we're done with this podcast. Um, so uh, please please look forward, listeners, to more Dragon Quest Eleven as well as some Dragon Age Two and some like and Dra like a Dragon Infinite Wealth coming next month. But uh, if you want to get in contact with us and ask us about our favorite Dragon Quest XI characters or like a dragon classes or dragons in Dragon Age, you can always email us retro at rpgfan.com. Also follow RPG Fan on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Discord, always called RPG Fan or RPG Fancom. Um, RPG Fan also has a shop. If you go to rpgfan.com slash shop, you can uh, shop for RPG Fan themed apparel, including... Uh, baby onesies, t-shirts, hoodies, phone cases. Uh, that's a great way to support the website. Uh, there's also two other fine podcasts on RPG Fan. Random Encounter every two weeks about randomness and what games are playing. And Rhythm Encounter every other two weeks about rhythmness and RPG music. You can review retro, random, and rhythm encounters on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or however you listen to podcasts. Please give us feedback at your own discretion. Um... But uh, if you want to reach out to us as individuals and not as a podcast, uh, let's tell the fine listeners how to get in contact with our fine panelists, starting with you, Gio. Yeah, you can find me at Discord. I go by Gio, or like 10 Star over there, T-E-N-B-I-S-T-A-R. Or you can also email me at um, geo at rpgfan.com. Now, Wes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Wes Iliff or on Blue Sky at Lone Weasel. Now, Tin. Oh, you can just find me on RPG Fan Discord. My name is my name is Tin, <laughs> right there. So. And listeners, uh, you can find me on Blue Sky or Instagram or Discord on all three places. I am called at Evoker for Dogs, and that is a reference to Persona Three, another game from uh, a loaded twenty twenty four that I that I am not playing right now because right now the uh, the RPG release schedule for the first few months of the year is frankly is frankly insane. I'm not, I I don't know when I'll ever get to P3 Reload or maybe even FF7 Rebirth. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> it's overwhelming. Oh <laughs> there are so many video games. I'm kind of amazed. I spent a full 3 weeks and 85 hours playing an old favorite from 20 from 2018. <laughs> it's just that good. And you know I don't think I regret a single moment of it. Uh, listeners, thank you. Good night and good luck. <laughs> <laughs>